So once again, we're watching Robert Sapolsky. He wrote the book Determined, talks about how he doesn't believe in free will, which brings up a lot of debate among certain communities. Of course, you know, a lot of, a lot of religious communities believe we have free will. Some people don't think we have free will. Some of us argue about it all the time. Evolution has pulled a simulation over your eyes that optimizes you for survival and not accuracy. Tragically, this prepares us for savannas, not cities, and that makes modern life very difficult to navigate well. But joining me today is legendary biologist Robert Sapolsky, and we're going to take a hard look at the hidden truth. While there is no God, there is no free will, and nothing happens for a reason, you can still massively improve your life. Right now, I think there's a lot of people that feel lost, they feel lazy, they have no sense of what to do with their lives. And given that there is no God, no purpose, and no free will, how do people go about improving their lives? Right off the bat, what I think that's tapping into is one of the misconceptions about the notion that there's no free will, which is that is synonymous with, oh my God, if everything's determined, nothing can ever change. And all you need to do is look at the world around you and know that like people change dramatically, societies change, all of that changes, the brain changes, there's this whole trendy, sexy field of neuroplasticity about how the brain does all that. Yeah, change occurs. Where people get into trouble is when change has occurred, they conclude, thus, I chose to change. And that's where you are predicating your whole stance on the notion that we are captains of our ships and there's free will and all of that. And that's not the case in the slightest. When we change, it is because we have been changed by a certain circumstance. Mm. And why have we been changed in the particular way that we have? Because all those prior circumstances that made us who we are. Over it's just not a already i love this okay i think we're biological creatures i think our organisms evolved over time all of this is a belief but also he just said something that i think is not universally true so that's the dilemma it's like that's not a universally true thing not all people change lots of people never change and in the ways they changed it's only an age lots of people never change much some people change a lot like i change a lot because of external and internal conflicts within the self that pushed me to change, transform. But not very many people transform. Lots of people live and die and are basically the same person their whole life. So I'm not sure if he means generally speaking or if he thinks those people are an anomaly versus I think they're the majority. So I wonder. Over which we had no control brought you to that moment so that you were going to respond to this stimulus in the way that you did and would change you in the way that it did. So we are capable of being changed and even better, once we are changed in a particular way, it can even lead us to modify our behavior so that we're changed in that way even more so. And nonetheless, we are not sitting there and exercising free will when we decide, you know, I'm no longer a Buddhist and instead I'm a nudist now or something. Buddhist to nudist. Let's go. So here's the way that I approach life is very much that um, everything is downstream of biology and ideas. And I've said many times on the show that on my tombstone, I wanted to read, you're having a biological experience because as somebody that has um, really, I have been changed profoundly. So I don't need to take any credit for that, but, but the just empirical evidence is I went from hardly being able to get myself out of bed uh, because I had a set of ideas uh, just based on what I had encountered, the home I grew up in, my personal genetics and the things that I respond to, but all of that led me to a point in my early 20s where I had a hard time getting out of bed. I'm talking, I would lay in bed for four to five hours a day, every day. And it was really only shame that eventually got me moving. Uh, so I wouldn't even take credit for that. But ultimately, I, I had biology that was to the point where I could receive the ideas. And then once I encountered those ideas, I was able to put together what I call a frame of reference that and I'll, I'll be as careful as I can. I know I'm going to slip up in terms of language that makes it sound like that I'm in the driver's seat, uh, but have have a frame of reference that is uh, puts me in a position where I am on a path. You're, you're already using words me and I'm. Ma'am. Path to improving and getting better. And so when you look at. If you use the words me and I'm, you've already put yourself in the driver's seat. I'm so confused. My life over a long period of time. I'm not that confused. I'm just being a dramatic streamer. I'm again without needing to clap for me. But as I've accumulated these ideas, it's had a, a profound impact on my life. The quality of my life, uh, my emotional tenor, the financial outcomes, all of it. And so I became obsessed as somebody who's worked in the inner cities. I've seen up close what it looks like when uh, somebody hasn't been given the right environment with which to build uh, their biology, uh, with which to get the right set of ideas. And it's absolutely devastating. And if I try to map out in my own mind what it means to exist in a world without free will, 
I start actually thinking of myself as a change agent, as a, uh, a capsule that carries ideas that when other people encounter those ideas, some of them will be changed. And so that to me is the frame for this conversation is going to be, what are the things that people need to do to their biology? Because they are hearing this, right? We can make that assumption. So they're hearing this. So now they're encountering these ideas. We'll assume that they're at least fertile enough soil that the ideas will take plant. Not all of them will, but it's just a more useful assumption. Um, what ideas would you want to plant in people's minds during this time that will be most fruitful if they want to move in a positive direction? For people to learn enough about the biology and its interaction with the environment and how it turns us into who we are out of our control, all of that, to recognize that blame and judgment and a sense of entitlement and self-satisfaction and none of those things make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. And all they do is send people in a bad direction, either of wanting people to be treated less well than average because of things that they've done that you were willing to decide they were responsible for or deciding that you should be treated better than average because of things that you've done that in actuality you did not earn and did not deserve and that you were just handed by random luck in life and if people come out of that you know deciding you know judgment is almost always a suspect concept and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to ever hate anybody because that's like hating you know plants that grow with some toxin and that have made you sick it's just but they do this is the part of like this that i find so fascinating i love it first and foremost love robert what a vibe right love tom what a vibe and at the same time i feel like they're describing a lived experience that is only the root so okay I'm an idiot, but this is my theory and philosophy on life that we are biological organisms evolved over time. But within that evolution, there's layers to it that allow you to use the tools your evolution gifted you to have a different relationship with life from a perspectival, like from a perception, not perspectival, like Verveke, sorry, <laughs> like uh, from a different perception, right? I think we're all animals. And so being mad at a human for killing someone is like being mad at the bear for killing someone. You shouldn't be mad at the human for killing someone. You should be recognizing that within yourself, I am upset that this person killed this person. But to be upset at the person is to be upset at the bear. And I do think some humans choose to be upset at the bear. And I think that's the wrong way to have a, like an introspective existence. But you might not want an introspective in, in existing or existence. So again, I think you get to choose or not choose by evoking parts of your free will. And you get to choose to engage or not engage with this initial reaction of hating the bear or this meditative perspective of hating the bear or not hating the bear. So I agree, there's no reason to hate anybody, but there, it's, it's understandable to have a feeling that feels like hate towards something that is actually about you. So I think when you hate someone, you actually hate yourself. You're actually saying, I hate myself for not accepting that this person is the bear, is an animal, is a person, right? But in order to do that, you have to have a relationship with what your biolog biology allows you to have a relationship with. So some people are limited. Some people don't get the full range of perspective. And I think that comes from biology and everything we do is within nature. So nature is running its course. It's like being mad at the tornado for being a tornado. So yes, there's that part of it, but also there's that micro, micro existence we're having, which is me right now on this stream. I know what words not to say on stream, guys. If I say them, I get demonetized. If I say them, I get ostracized. If I say them, I know not to do that. Why do I know not to do that? It's a learned behavior. I'm using a learned behavior that I've brought into my consciousness as a part of adapting to the environment which you could argue is exactly what biology, like is biology, is being a living organism, right? But why do I choose not to say those words, right? Why do I know about the consequences? Why am I able to like recognize I'm a person? Obviously everything you do is biological or in biology because you are a biological organism. Now outside of what biology allows you to do, I think it allows you to do a lot. So again, when he says there's no reason to ever hate someone, I think that's also not understanding that because we hate people, it's within our nature. Like, I'm surprised he would say that. I agree with him. As a philosophy, it makes no sense to hate people because that's like hating the bear. But we are also everything we're supposed to be. The world is exactly the way it's supposed to be because it's exactly how we are as biological organisms. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, I would love to see the world changed. 
but I'm only desiring that change because this is the react, like the relationship I'm having with perception, which is the relationship I'm having with biology, which is the relationship I'm having with being evolved, which is the relationship I'm having with my genetic, like where my genetics come from. So yes, but I'm not sure that takes away the concept of free will in the very micro sense of change. Even to argue that you can change things is what humans really mean when they say free will, guys. They're not saying much. When we say free will, we're saying, can you do something other than what your base instinct is telling you to do? That's really what we're saying, right? So uh, when he says there's no free will, he's kind of not saying that though. Because when people say free will, they mean what he means in the same way. So I'm not sure that he's really saying anything that hasn't been said before, which is just, again, none of this matters. We're all going to die. Our stuff is going to be someone else's stuff in 100 years. But Adrian says, I think he means philosophically too, though. I, I Right. But he does mean it in a philosophy sense, but he's using science as a way to argue objective in a way that is actually not true. And that's the thing with Robert's work that confuses people. Because he's using his trump card as a scientist, he's also making a claim sort of objective that isn't totally true because it's still through perception, his perception, which is valid, right? You know, outcome stuff. And that no matter how good you are at something, um, that doesn't entitle you to more consideration of your needs than anybody else deserves. What do you think are the evolutionary reasons why we have that proclivity? So people bend towards not even bend, they are yanked towards the illusion of free will. And as I really sit, like whenever somebody asks me about this, if I'm being interviewed, I'll say, yeah, free will is an illusion, but it really doesn't matter. We'll get to the societal implications because I know that's an important part of your book and, and your stance. But on an individual life, I don't think, I think it is far wiser to act as if you have free will because that frame of reference will uh, put you in a more empowered mindset, which I think makes you more fertile for good ideas to take hold. Um, does that seem to you why we would, from an evolutionary standpoint, have developed that delusion? Well, it certainly can be the, the fuel of motivation. Um, and that is something that obviously is highly adaptive in many circumstances. Um, it's also incredibly protective psychologically. I mean, we are a weird species in that we are the only ones out there who know that inevitably at some point our hearts are going to stop beating. Whoa, bummer. And the only way to function. Why don't we say that? I don't understand why we keep saying that. See, even the way we're using words is so bubbled. So because we're like a diverse species amongst different cultures, even the way we're using words aren't true. Animals have shown that they know they're going to die. They might not how far into the future they know that. We're finding out right now that dogs like judge us, that plants have a consciousness. I don't know why we always make the mistake. And it happens with everyone where we just think we know everything. And I feel like we're just discovering things. So what does it mean when we say like science has proven free will is an illusion? What does that even mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Like it doesn't even mean anything. When you say it, it doesn't mean anything. It only means what you think it means. What does even the word free and will mean? What is a will? Why not just talk about the control and freedom and drop obscure magic words like free will? How is free will magic? Like, again, did you guys learn about free will as being related to magic or supernatural stuff? To me, free will means making a choice with an understanding that you can make another choice, like a real understanding of free will. That's all free will means. So when you have this conversation about like, what is free will? Like, what are we talking about? We're all just our perceptions and our biology. Cosmic says, but you have to learn to change the base instinct. Therefore, if you never change the biology because there's no experience for your brain to reference, which uh, supports the determinist, which is fair. I think it, we are determined and we evoke free will on the, I think on the macro it's determined, but on the micro it's obviously different. Like it was always going to be what is going to be. Andrew Tate was always going to be Andrew Tate. Sneeko was always going to be Sneeko. I'm always going to be me. You're always going to be you. Whatever was going to happen was always what was going to happen. And at the same time, within that framework, zooming in like Tom is saying, ultimately, most of us do sort of believe in free will because we act like we certainly live like it. But I think that's what's interesting. Like you could argue like what is free will if you can't have a conversation? What is free will if you can't understand somebody? What is free will if you can't even understand that you're alive? What is free will if we're not even having a relationship with like what is true? Because truth is so far from us. 
what is free will? What are we talking about? You know, non pulsals I certainly never went like, gee, what? Like, gee, I feel like I am having some free will. That's weird. You don't know the difference. I feel like I distinctly know the difference when I'm evoking my true free will and when I'm just reacting to things. Because I don't think, I think some people are just reacting. I still think some people are in the present really contemplating action. And I think most of the time you're reacting because of trauma, biology, trauma to the brain. You know, you're re- there's so many things that make a person do something. Right. Well, says science has studied it and the studies say the brain already knows what you're going to choose before you know it. Hence why free will doesn't exist. I can't explain it well, but some maybe someone else can. I think that's the same thing. Maybe I'm too autistic. I feel like that's the same thing. Like I feel like saying something's a spectrum is like saying the same thing as saying it's secure circular saying like I have no free will, but my brain already knows what I'm going to do before I do it is the same thing as saying I have free will to have a thought beforehand to contemplate choice. If you mean we literally don't have free will, I just don't think that exhibits correctly in the way that we socialize. I don't think it's tangible. And I think this argument has been made a lot that it's not really tangible you know what I mean? To really think that there is no free will in in the way that we decide to socialize, right? I don't think that's totally true in the sense that of in the way that I, I guess, think of free will. Maiden says that's the folk model of free will. And there's that scientific understanding of what it means. I think often people are talking across purposes by talking about different things. Yeah, I do think there's a lot of like miscommunication happening when these conversations are going on, even like from myself, right? Because I only know what I know. Adrian says, basically, the reason free will doesn't exist is because all decisions are made in the subconscious. Instincts and thoughts all come from the subconscious, meaning the brain and not the consciousness. It depends on how we're defining that relationship in a lived experience. Like the more introspective you become, the more I think you're able to understand like what is happening versus not happening. But also at the end of the day, when it comes to physical action, you know what I mean? There has to be some sort of like There's some social game that gets played because of that. I understand that, you know, perspective. I believe in the subconscious. I believe in the consciousness. But I also believe the brain is, like, I believe the relationship we're having. And again, it's all belief because, again, science is so flawed and humans are flawed. So when they, like, create these structures around it, I think it's a flawed thinking. Like, I think Robert starts off the argument badly when saying, I know what he's saying from a philosophy perspective, but I think in a tangible, practical one, it's unfair and cruel to people to be told um, you have no free will, so don't hate people. It's like that doesn't mean anything. Like it means something to the philosopher. It means something to the scientist. It means something to – so I guess what our job is is to listen and to consider how to translate that. And this this is a good challenge for me as well because I've been told that my work doesn't translate to like the average person and I need to learn how to speak more generally Um, so, okay, this is good. What would it mean to you if there was absolutely no free will? Nothing. It wouldn't mean anything. Like, it just wouldn't mean anything. You know what I mean? It just wouldn't mean anything. Is to have evolved a very unique capacity for self-deception. We are a species that can generate enough circumstances where we know that bad news is coming and we can't do anything about it and where that could be crushing, that it has become adaptive to decide that we actually have more agency than we do in reality. Wait, you guys are talking about the subconscious versus the unconscious. I just think of the subconscious of the things that are happening in the background. Like I always know things are going in the background and the consciousness is what I'm having in the relationship of the foreground. And I think the best way to appreciate that is to look at a disease of people who were not able to do self-deception and who were not able to rationalize away reality. And what that is, is clinical depression. These are people who are pathologically prone towards seeing the world for what it is. And they're like poster children for showing the psychologically protective effects of being able to decide that things are gonna be okay and you're the master of your fate and then that sort of thing. It's good for our mental health until it turns out not to be good for our mental health. So how do we walk that line? Because that's one of the questions I had reading your book is, uh, why try so fervently to pull people out of a delusion that, as you just said, is better for their mental health? Well, calling a perception a delusion is wrong. I think that's wrong. It's, I don't think that's the right relationship to have with language personally. Um, like a delusion to me is, uh, more of a radical break with reality, but reality is perception. 
And so perception, like there's a difference there. I think I kind of take a little bit of annoyance with that a little bit. Um, I know he doesn't have free will, so he had to write this book. But also <laughs> I'm a little annoyed because like the way he's using language is like so specific. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I guess he just had to write this book. Tracy says, do you think consciousness is in the brain or beyond the brain? Well, I believe in for the sake of language here. I think the brain is sort of, um, I think we are what is the collection of data within the brain. So like your soul is a collection of data within that consciousness. But I think the brain is sort of like runs it. Like I know my heart isn't who I am. I know my brain isn't, I think my brain isn't who I am. Um, but I also know my brain is a processing machine and it feels like it helps me process my consciousness which is the relationship I'm having with the internal. So call it what you want to call it. I don't care. But the thing that makes me me and the thing that makes you you, that's what I call a consciousness. And then how it works and the machinery that it was given, like this body that I'm in, is just like the machinery to make me express that consciousness. And I do think, like, I, like I've said in my past work, I do really believe like we're born into categories. We're born into tropes. I can't choose my face. I can't choose my personality. I think that's what I was born as. But I've even changed those things. Like I just had a caller today and we were talking about transformation and how I used to be the girl that read a book every day. And now I'm not in that category anymore. And as I'm working out, I'm going to be the girl who works out. And that's like a new category of perception. And then you change as you go along. And a part of it is a part of life and like when things happen, like I don't rush life, like life happens when it happens, which is sort of a determinist take. And then at the same time, I think I evoke my free will to do something different. And at the same time, like I, I don't mind if it's not free will or if it is free will, right? So again, what is free will? I think you're just using a word to have a relationship with making a choice that isn't reactive, so I've seen people be reactive. I've been reactive. I've been reactive on stream. And I'm like, oh, I'm not like really evoking what I would call free will, which is not being reactive. But ultimately, of course, we're biological organisms evolved over time. And I also believe that animals have a sense of awareness of their consciousness on a, on a spectrum just like humans. I don't think all humans have an awareness of their consciousness, but I think some animals do and I don't think all of them do. So that's something from a lived anecdotal experience that I feel like is clear. Plus from the little bit of uh, study that's been coming out, like if dogs are judging us and plants have a consciousness, <coughs> like there's something to be said about the relationship we think we're having as one form of living organism. Again, I don't want humans to keep running into the thing of thinking they're super, super special. What I don't think anyone is special. I just think we're all a unique, we're having a unique relationship within the universe, right? Adrian says, basically, I believe we're the machine. We are the bodies in our brains, but it doesn't matter because I go through life. If I uh, have free will, not thinking about it. I mean, we all just go through life with what we have. We go through life processing free will with the tools that we have, right? Uh, Cosmic says, by that logic, the brain isn't separate from the laws of physics, therefore no free will. Yeah, again, so just what do you guys think about my definition of free will, meaning making a decision outside of the reactive? Making a decision outside of the reactive. So I'm looking at it as a spectrum of introspection, which again is why I created the levels. Links down below for that. But the reason I wrote out the levels was to give an example, or I guess should say videoed out the levels, is because I want to give an example of being at your base level where you're just sort of like fumbling, your other level where you're sort of just reacting and you're in a bubble that's told you how to be and then you go outside of that and you say, well, what if there's something else? Like maybe Robert on my level system is like a five. But I don't know, right? Because it depends on why he thinks the way he's thinking. Is he a five who's using determinism to talk about fiveness? Or is he a two using determinism to talk about what he thinks he discovered? And that's the question. Because it turns out it all depends on who the person is. Um, I would bet anybody who would go out and buy this book about the neurobiology and philosophy of the free will debate and all of that and actually go and read it, my guess would be they're not homeless. My guess would be they had enough protein in their diet when they were a kid and the opportunity of schooling that they actually know how to read and can comprehend it. I bet all sorts of things about them. In other words, they're one of the lucky ones. 
And there's this ironic pre-screening that anyone who has the luxury in life to sit around and think about, are we captains of our own fate? And what does biology tell us? And how about Aristotle and all that? That we are the lucky ones who have wound up in this position. And thus, what being convinced that there's no free will does is take the wind out of a lot of our accomplishments. What do you mean I didn't earn having my corner office and being a CEO? What do you mean I didn't earn my advanced college degrees? I worked hard. I were, There are all those nights where my roommate went to parties and I stayed and studied instead. I earned this. I earned this. I earned love by being like a kind person or empathic or whatever. And like, whoa, bummer. That's deflating to hear that if it's true, I don't believe it, blah, blah, that I did not earn any of this, that none of this. The, the, the dilemma with this thinking, I think it's somewhat true and somewhat not true. Obviously, there's parts of the population that are just like born into the right genetic predispositions connected to the right like outlook on where so, like social expectation has come and bubbles have been formed and all that stuff. And then there are the outliers and communities who've just gotten the shit end of the stick which then I should feel like they have the right to like off themselves or something. Cause a part of me thinks like, I don't know. I can't think of myself as like winning the lottery anymore. If I think of myself as like lucky that I was born into this body. And even though it's flawed, it's pretty good and it manages, but it is interesting to hear that perspective because I understand how someone, I think even on my level system will hear my levels of introspection and hear like, Oh, so we can't change. And it's like, no, you can change. And I think Robert's saying the same thing. I think we're saying the same thing, but I'm saying it as like a a person who went through a journey and he's saying it as like a scientist who did research. And I'm saying my lived experiences says people change, but also I was always going to be who I was going to be. But also I changed and I changed my future and I made decisions, but also the decisions were made for me. And I think both of those things live in conjunction because I think life is all contradiction. So I think through my perception that I'm going to moralize people's decisions and judge them for cheating on their spouses. I'm going to judge you for raping children. I'm going to do that. And Robert is saying, why are you judging people? And I'm saying, I'm not judging people as a species. I'm not saying I'm judging them as a bear in the woods. I'm saying I'm making a judgment from a perspective of somebody who is having a relationship with herself. I don't like it. And the judgment is coming from me, the person that is I, who doesn't like it. And I was maybe, you could say, part of the species that was always going to have a problem with that particular behavior because of the way I was raised or the relationship I was having with my consciousness. Or you could say because I'm a biological organism evolved over time. But even my ability to like choose to moralize or to change my ideas on previous thoughts is enough to take action and change the course of your life, which you could argue was always determined for you, which is fine. Like that is fine, right? I just don't think it ends up ends up mattering too much. I ultimately think like none of us could be doing anything we're doing, but we all have to do exactly what we're doing because there's no way around it. Like, again, I like Nazis had to be Nazis. They couldn't have been not Nazis. And at the same time, the way we punish Nazis is as if they had a choice in being Nazis, but they didn't have a choice. But obviously, individual people had a choice in being a Nazi, but not any more choice than anyone has being anyone, anything that they are. So I think both those things are true at once. I think you were always going to be what you were going to be and you have a choice not to be. But figuring out the differences and the nuance of that is introspection. And I think that that's what's really difficult in society because you would have to acknowledge that you never had the choice and you still have the choice, but you never had it in the beginning. But you have it now. But you never have it. But you always have it. Reflected the core of the me in there with all these wonderful positive attributes. But what that mostly means though to me is – most people on earth, rather than being given privilege and power and, you know, efficacy and all of that because of traits that they didn't really earn, that they had no control over and they just lucked out with, most people on earth instead are suffering deprivations and being ignored or neglected or considered unworthy of attention or because they're getting treated badly because of stuff they had no control over. So virtually by definition, anyone who's going to go and read a book like this is going to be bummed by it and, and feel like, oh my, no, I can't work that way because look, I busted my ass in grad school or whatever. Um, and the people whose lives are being made a lot tougher by the fact that it's all random, um, all that there's no free will does is free you from the myth that this is a just world and people get what they deserve it's very interesting 
It frees you from thinking this is a just world and people get what they deserve. You know I don't like the word deserve. I don't think anyone should be entitled to deserve. So I do think we're talking about like very similar things in a sense, just using different perspectives. Discord says, could we say free will is just conscious consideration and that consideration is informed by our biology? So because biology fluctuates, our ability to engage with free will also does. I would agree with that. I would agree with that statement. I'll read it again. Could we say free will is just a conscious consideration and that consideration is informed by our biology? So because biology fluctuates, our ability to engage with free will also does. Yeah, I think that's, be yeah, I do think that's true. Yeah. So, okay, I'm, I agree with him there that like no one is entitled, okay? Um, the idea of earning something is through a construct. So I think everything is a construct of the fact that we're evolved biological uh, organisms over time. And then when we hold moral judgment, we're holding it through our perception. It's not objective, right? I don't believe in objective morality. Matt says, uh, I feel closest to free will when I override habits or thought patterns and do some rewiring, consciously choosing better habits throughout patterns. Yeah, I think that's a part of evoking what I would call free will, even though ultimately like it is just all part of our biology. Cosmic says, reminder that Robert is not making any strict normative claims. He's more interested about what's more likely, uh, more likely true free will or determinism. Right. I think, uh, yeah, as we're listening to this, I'm not saying like Robert is making any strong claims or that I'm making any strong claims. We're just throwing shit at the wall and figuring it out because this is what we've decided to do with our life or not. And so we're here just doing it. Adrian says, nah, he doesn't have a problem with you judging people as being unsafe or disgusting. He's just saying that they can't help who they are. And so logically and philosophically, it's kind of dumb to hate them. I think that's almost always true, but not always, always true. I'm just asking if he's saying it, it's always true or just sometimes true. Because I'm saying it's only sometimes true. The reason you see me being so lenient on Sneeko and other people is because I think they're engaging only so much with what their consciousness is able to engage with. The reason I'm so lenient on certain people is because I'm like, they don't have the tools. Judging them is unfair. But people are like, but you should judge them, Brittany. You should hate them. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to hate them because like I'm judging them through this understanding of them, right? And sometimes I'm judging people in ways that I'm not even judging them. I'm just judging them because that's the way they've asked to be judged. So if somebody says, I'm very smart, I'm very capable, I'm the most logical person in the room, even though I don't think that, and I would be more than willing to be lenient on them, I'm not going to choose to be lenient on them because they're the ones who's already decided, judge me like that. So, okay, I'll judge you like that. Sure. Especially if they're older, right? So I agree that Robert and I are saying similar things in the sense like we're not judging you, but also I am judging you, but also I'm not saying it's outside of your, like you're just being a human, dude. What is my saying? Human's gonna human. What's the saying on my channel? Human's gonna human. Why? Because that's just what we're doing, dude. The bear is gonna bear, the human is gonna human. It's the same fucking thing. So again, when we're having this relationship, it's like people are just doing what people do, Right? It's just doing it. When you use words like you can't help it and you have no other choice, that's just not actively, practically true. And that's my only problem. So Cosmic says, it's always true, but you can't help it because of your biology. Language like that makes no functional sense in, in a pragmatic sense. It only is true when it's true. You know what I mean? Like it's, it doesn't work in how humans perceive reality. And so I do think it's necessary to perceive reality in a particular way in order to have a more realistic relationship with it and probably a more joyful one. You know what I mean? Fishy says, I'm hearing a fairness problem unless I don't understand his view. I don't know. Cosmic says, your own judgment isn't out of your own free will. That's also what Robert is saying. Kay says the desire to prove one side of the coin as the whole truth over the other prevents you from seeing the whole coin. Yeah, I feel like I don't think that's true in the pragmatic sense or in the lived experience sense, but I think it could be true in an underlining sense. But I think both work together. I think your biology works with your consciousness and I think your consciousness works with your biology. And I think in a practical sense, when we're having a relationship with free will, it is obviously real. It's just maybe not the underlining perception that works in the most Robert way. Discord says, I think free will is a myth mainly because the choices you make are truly dedicated by what you know. If you truly don't know something, why would you make a different decision, especially on the scientific level? 
where even your thoughts can be read by MRI using AI to picture what you see in your head. So what is the thought outside of the brain if it can be viewed and reproduced through AI? Personally, I don't see any evidence that there's anything happening outside of the body that isn't just a function of the brain. I'm not sure those things are contradictory. I just don't think free will and determinism are not, comp I think they're so complementary. I just think they so make sense within together. To have them not work together doesn't make any sense to me. They both complement each other. Like to say things are our biology is the same thing as saying they're also a part of our free will. In my brain, the way that I process information is to say the thing that I call free will is also attached to my biology, but it's not the chicken or the egg. I think they work in conjunction. I don't think you can even have a relationship. Like you're always having a relationship with your biology, right? If you're in a coma, but you're not always having a relationship with your consciousness, because when you're outside of a coma, you operate differently. That nuance of that operation is simply what people have a, like, have a simple concept of free will with. But then I would go even deeper and say, there is an even deeper level to free will if you have the right kind of relationship with your consciousness. Let's say you're having a discussion with a friend and the friend says, I don't like the way you talk. It makes me, it hurts my feelings. Well, why does it hurt your feelings? They're having a biological reaction to maybe something deeply rooted in their biology, maybe trauma. But why does it hurt their feelings? If everything is determined or everything is free will, why are they choosing to have their free will to react negatively to what is said? Or why do they have the determined biological perspective of having an offense to the thing that was said? We would have to ask the why. And I want an answer for the why. And I, that's what I call free will. Or the relationship with the consciousness is the why. Right? Matt says, so what would be the reason then for choosing things outside of what you were taught? People do it all the time, even before the internet. Right. So children do things even if they don't have the information. We do act even outside of the no. I do personally think we act outside of what we know. We act with, we are only with the tools we have and what we know. But in some ways, we also know things subconsciously, maybe through instinct or intuition. You could argue that's a part of biology. Obviously it is, Right. Kay says there are, whole, there are parts of a whole process, so you can't have the process without having all the necessary parts. Yeah, obviously, let's keep going. I'm interested in it. But I think that there's an interesting thing happening here where we're talking about how there's no free will, but he's also moralizing people. He's saying he's moralizing people who judge. And that doesn't make sense. Because if it's because in some concept, in some bubble, you're going to hear there's no free will. So why are you even judging? Robert himself is judging. Right. That's what I would call a judgment. I'm saying Robert is judging people by saying we should not judge people, that he's making a judgment, which I think is within reason. And I would say we're all biological creatures, so we should judge with wisdom what to do with people in the most compassionate way, because sometimes they don't and are not evoking their free will. They're just moving off biology. And then sometimes because we're all biology, we're moving off our biology. We just have a deeper better understanding of it than other people. And we should be more compassionate to people who don't have that, not less. But we tend to have the reverse. In society, we tend to have less compassion for people who have a worse relationship with free will than other people. And we also think we're evoking free will when we're really just being reactionary. Non-Paul says that's moot. It's like asking why in a movie as it plays, as if there could have been any other way it plays out. It's nonsense and we just can't see the future. I just disagree. I just think you're like, that feels so shallow to me. That can't possibly be the depth of knowledge in the subject, right? There's just no way. Fishy says he's just using a lot of deserved language and I get it, but I don't. Yeah, it's interesting. So let's see. Interesting. So when I, I, I really tried to parse through, okay, what do I want people to do with this information? And from my perspective, and I'll be very interested to see if we agree on this, from my perspective, the, the only reason I want people to acknowledge that free will uh, doesn't exist is that if you do not understand your own biology, you're going to derail. So if you don't understand that you have a bias towards in-group, then you're going to treat people. I do think everyone has a bias and a prejudice. And when people say they don't, I look at them funny. In the out-group ridiculously. If you understand that you have a penchant towards in-group, but that you can, and this is something that I learned from you, so much of what we're going to talk about today I've learned from you, but um, take sports. You look at somebody that's of a different ethnicity that in one instance you clock as an out group. And then if they're wearing a jersey of your favorite team, you suddenly clock as an in group. So understanding the way in which the way I always say it is your brain is messing with you. Your brain is optimized to keep. So he's separating the brain from the consciousness. That's what he's doing right now. And he says your brain is messing with you. Keep you alive long enough to have kids that have kids. Now, that's not the thing that I focus on. What I focus on is. And then he decided not to have children. That's his choice. 
do you have what I'll call a good life? And it's probably worth us defining that. Uh, so for me, my North Star is I'm trying to um, move the individual and society as an echo of the individual towards increased human flourishing and decreased human suffering. Now, I'm going to make the base assumption you're not a sociopath and all of that, because sure, the thing that makes Hitler flourish is going to be very different uh, <laughs> than what I hope makes the vast majority of humanity flourish. But that that's sort of my North Star. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to pause it really fast because uh, dependum. I don't want to say that word says, I think Robert is referring more to the religious idea of free will, which is that we all have equal ability to choose between good and evil and biology doesn't determine these things. Okay. That makes more sense to me actually, because obviously that would be an outrageous claim. I don't believe that at all. Right. Okay. Uh, interesting. Then I could see that I'm not using free will in that sense, even though I was raised super Catholic. I don't think of it that way. Obviously, I moved away from religion because it didn't account for biology or mental health or different brains or genetic or genetic, um, you know, consequences, obviously. And I don't believe like everyone has the ability to have the same relationship with their consciousness as other people. I just think like it depends on your biology and the brain you were got, you know, you got and all that stuff. OK. OK. To get people to understand your brain is not optimized. Oh, and then um, Cosmic says Robert is being descriptive about why it's hard not to believe in free will. I think this is probably awkward for this community to watch this because obviously we've been talking about introspection and how people are born into bubbles and we live in bubbles. And so the idea um, that like somebody might think like, yeah, we've already. Yeah. OK, so maybe I'm not watching this as like a normie, so I'm not thinking about it that way. But I guess a two watching this would think, um, what do you mean? I really earned that job. Like I worked for my life. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. we all like, you know, pretty privilege and race and so like social expectations play into it and all these things. But like if you don't believe in those things, then I could see them hearing Robert say there's no free will. And like, no, I really made it this far. Like obviously I, I chose the easiest path because I am this person in this this body and this brain and everything that it is, like, this is the best thing for it. So I, like, give it this life. But I also think, like, I chose in some ways what I would call chose through free will to have a better relationship with reality itself and to recognize that we're all just here on a planet, like, probably living or probably living organisms evolved over time, right? For joy, it's not optimized for pleasure. It is optimized for survival in a historic evolutionary environment that we're no longer in. And so there is this wild mismatch between what you what will make you thrive today and your impulses. So that's where I root around. OK, this is why I'm trying to get people to understand this. Is is there any of that that um, you focus on as well? Or are you interested only in that societal echo of, hey, morons, you're acting foolishly and you're holding people accountable for things that make no sense? Well, no, I think framing things and you've got the perfect word for it in terms of the evolutionary mismatches that we deal with we've got you know paleolithic appetites and suddenly we've got fast food and you know, obesity epidemic all of that i mean the, the mismatch is is a really useful concept in terms of all of this um we have a mismatch in that our building blocks of agency our building blocks of a sense of efficacy and of registering with those around us we were built with 99% of human history spent in small hunter-gatherer bands where you did have efficacy and your opinion counted because everyone's opinion counted, very egalitarian by the best guesses. And these were familiar and you registered and you had a sense of efficacy. And now we're in a society where... Yeah, so this idea is really hard. non Paul says choice just happens, just... Not just not magic choice, but explainable, understandable choice. Free will is an anti-rational meme resisting explanation and understanding. You're using language that's not translating. Choice just happens. Just not magical choice, but explainable, understandable choice. Yeah, it feels like you're making an argument for re like reaction belief. I We're reacting to reactions to reactions, but I just don't think that's necessarily what happens when you're more introspective i think you can deviate from the reaction and i think you can do something else which you could argue is still a part of like a deterministic perspective but what you're saying isn't translating to the practical or at least to the lived experience it might be true for a lot of people but i think a lot of people are born into bubbles and stay in bubbles and don't question anything and i do think like the average person might be upset at what robert's saying i'm just saying he's explaining 
one thing that makes sense to me, but not fully explaining how it coincides with like an anecdotal understanding of life, right? Um, you know, just to mention once we stumbled into idiocy of inventing like socioeconomic status after inventing stuff and the unequal distribution of stuff, once we get into that, we can have somebody who's born into poverty and I'm not exact on the statistics, but in this country, there's now something like a 90% chance that they will still be in poverty as an adult. Yeah. In other words, they can be subject to a world of lack of control. And I'm sorry, are we, are the scientists fighting about this? Because I feel like it's called breaking generational curses and also people are doing it with the right tools, but they won't do it without the right tool. So if a conservative who believes in free will and is religious says, um, poor people choose to be poor, that's not actually correct in the sense with the tools they have and the knowledge they have and the genetic predispositions they have and the environment they're raised into and the bubble they're given, they often repeat cycles of understanding and this can be explained through psychology. This can be explained in terms of social sciences. This can be explained in a lot of senses, which you can then in a universal sense chalk up to biology. But is Robert saying that if a person is homeless, they'll always be homeless? Or is he saying without the tools, they'll be homeless? Because the tools themselves are part of that evolutionary um, adaptive behavior that we're aiming to encourage people to have. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? He's explaining something that like, we already know how to stop it. We just don't do it because like some bubbles don't believe in it. And lack of agency and lack of free will in a pretty bruising kind of way, that's very novel for humans. Um, I think that's one aspect of the mismatch in that our tendency to delude ourselves into thinking we have more agency than we actually do um, didn't have that much of a chance to go off the rails. It was- You just have the agency that you have, no more, no less pretty focused in reality back when we were being like 99% of humans. And it's this current world instead where it is so destructive for so many people to be taught that they deserve what they get. When I think about the way things are, I'm always looking for what- Yeah, obviously, who's what bubble is that? Like what bubble is teaching you you like deserve what your life ended up being? Who's in that bubble? What bubble is this? Like I know what bubble he might mean, but like, what bubble is that? What bubble literally thinks like, I deserve this? Because even the conservatives I listen to, they don't talk like that. He's talking in a particular way. I feel like he's describing a very specific bubble. What's he talking about? I'm trying to think of who it would be. Um, Like really snobby fucking people. Like in a TV show, I can see their trope on the screen. Like, or, oh, like on Luffy, on, um, on, um, on, a. Uh, uh, One Piece. There's the Celeste. What are they called? The dragons. I don't want to give anything away. Don't don't keep. Never mind. No spoilers. No spoilers. I haven't finished. But they're kind of like people who think like I was born this way, and this is just like every like what is this bootstrap energy? They don't think that bootstrap people do not think like this. Cosmic says you keep using descriptive language, Brittany. Breaking generational curses doesn't prove free will. It's just describing a change. That's all that. What's the difference between agency and free will, Discord says? Um, it depends on the bubble. It depends on the perspective. Again, we're not agreeing on what free will means. That's the problem. I don't even know what he means when he says free will. Because he keeps using it in a way that I like, I don't know what he's talking about. Free will is like such a subjective, like what is he even talking about? Cosmic says you just don't like it. Brittany, it's a preference issue for you. At least it's just my belief. I'm not even sure what we're talking. I'm still trying to clarify what does he mean by when he says free will. Like I'm still trying to clarify what is Tom doing with his life? If there's no free will, who gives a fuck about humanity? Like my, my interest in humanity literally went out the window the moment I realized like humans were going to human. I'm only interested in the individual having like a nice life. Humanity is always going to as a whole going to do what it's going to do. So why does Tom say there's no free will, but is dedicating his life to convincing people there's no free will? Seems like a fucking weird life, but like maybe he has no choice. So again, I'm just trying to figure out like, what is he talking about? 
Tracy says that's the meritocracy bubble, I think. He's talking to Americans, I'm pretty sure, because I don't know about anyone else. But I was still taught some of that in school. Graduated high school four years ago. Okay, interesting. Paul says no deserve is usually um, meted out onto others when it's negative. Retributive justice and in-group members when it's positive. Yeah, all this is social science, bro. All this is psychology and trauma and biology. Why is he phrasing it this way? Maybe I'm just too in the psychology bubble. But like, yeah, like social studies covers this. Biology, philosophy covers this. Um... I must, this is just like a, I think the way they're having the relationship to the conversation is like very different to me, but okay, I'm learning things. What is the evolutionary explanation of how that would come to pass? Like why, if, if we don't have free will and we are just billiard balls bouncing around, something is selecting for that. And when I think about meritocracy is probably a good place to start. When I think about meritocracy, that isn't going to go away. Uh, no matter how many people recognize that they don't have free will. And one idea that I love of yours is this idea that we are machines that are aware of our machineness, but aren't comfortable with, with our machineness. And when I think about, okay, if, if I could get everybody to just snap, not think about meritocracy, um, I don't think it will work. And the reason that I don't think it will work is as much as it pains me to say this, there are machines, meaning us, I'm using your word, uh, that are better at things than other people. And whether we should or not, we value different things, right? So once you have an evolutionary algorithm running in your brain that says, not only do I want you to survive, I want you to pass on your genes to the next generation and I want them to survive. So now that algorithm creates what I'll refer to as a simulation. So it, it is not trying to show you the real world, right? We only see 0.00035% of the available electromagnetic spectrum. So it's like, we already know this is a gross simplification of what's there. And if it's simplifying, it's making decisions of what to show, what not to show. And it's making those based on that desire for survival. So now I'm like, okay, uh, if that's true, then the things that we have now, theoretically at least, are selected for because they do a good job of that. And since we are optimized to be good at things that allow our genes to pass forward, there's already a hierarchy of values. You're never going to be able to get people to ignore that some machines are better at those things that we value than others. Does that make sense? Totally. Um, and two levels of response. Um, the first amid that picture of, yeah, we are driven to pass on copies of our genes, all of that. But then you get somebody who joins some group that involves celibacy. Or then you get somebody who adopts a child from the other side of the planet who bears virtually no genetic relatedness to them. And yeah, there are strong trends that have been sculpted by evolution, but you know, we specialize in the idiosyncrasies of being exceptions at every possible turn. I mean, there's not a whole lot of evolutionary biology that could explain like giving up your life for somebody on the other side of the planet in a setting like that. So we are we are shaped by evolution but we we managed to have a lot of wiggle room with it but in this larger sense now of like what do we do with the fact that we are machines who could know our machineness what do we do with the fact that we kind of want to have a world in which dangerous people can't do damage and where competent people are the ones who are doing difficult stuff how do you do that and in some ways dealing with the dangerous people is a lot easier and quarantine models of all sorts that are out there that that people who are asking not for reform of criminal justice system but replacing it entirely what's the much harder one for my money is the flip side um which is how do you deal with the fact that it makes no sense whatsoever to like decide that someone who has the skills to remove that brain tumor from your head and can do that amazingly well and is totally unique in that regard blah blah all of that um, it's really hard to construct a world in which they will not somehow feel entitled. My wife, Lisa. Entitled is, I fucking hate entitlement in people, but you know, what is it to hate entitlements? To hate how annoyed I am by it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I feel, I feel like if I talked to Robert, we'd be saying the same thing, just using completely different bubbles to explain it. Because obviously, yeah, so when I say like I'm open to spiritualism, I mean it as a mode of a tool, not as like a literal reality. Does that make sense? 
So I use spiritualism as like a tool to explain a phenomenon, but I don't actually believe in like magic or and I think metaphysics is just like unexplained. So I think we are like machines on a planet, but machines are a little too robotic. Like, you know, I'm not really into like the machine language, but I kind of get it. Like I have vibe with it because I think of like computers, but I also just like the idea that we're organisms evolved over time and we are like the bear which is a more spiritual perspective because it's to say we're a part of the earth but it's also not a spiritual perspective it's just an evolutionary one so I do agree with basically everything that he just said but I also think all things are true through perception and then I think this idea that we have access to objective t truth is probably not going to be a maxed out reality like I'm not sure our understanding of biology is enough to have a concrete, so it's a probability theory, which I think meshes with my probability theory that again, as a layman I have, that human beings are living organisms evolved over time and have a different relationship with their introspection, extrospection, and that different relationship with them causes them to evoke what I call free will, but would, uh, what Robert would claim is change. And I think in order to make that change, I don't need to have this title of determinist. The reason I like reject the labels is because I think they are boxed and constructs created by the limitations of the human um, uh, perception, human perception. So I think it is probably less good to have a relationship with the labels because I think they are less useful when looking for objective truth because they have to exist outside of like perception and labels are a relationship with perception. And again, I don't think I'll have that relationship with objective truth outside of perception because I'm a biological creature evolved over time. But at the same time, I think in a practical sense, it's hard to explain to people that they don't have free will and that people still feel smart. It's interesting when I meet determinists or people who say they're determinists also say they think they're smart and don't have bias and don't have prejudice. Because I do meet a lot of people who identify as determinists who also think they don't have bias or prejudice. So what is that? What is that phenomenon, right? So to even identify as a determinist, I feel like it's one of those high IQ traps that people who are like, I know the science, so I think I know everything. And I'm like, okay, your high IQ is making you, oops, I used the word, fuck, reductive. It is a construct. It doesn't even mean anything. I don't have free will. I didn't have, I don't have free will. I just said it. I just said I didn't evoke my free will in that moment. I just said it. I don't have free will. I don't have, I'm not responsible for this. So yeah, I think obviously at our root, we're having a relationship with our biology, right? And our biology gives us tools to unlock what I would believe is like a relationship with what we could argue is practical free will. Maiden says, what would a consciousness that is able to transcend subjectivity look like? What would it be like to be such a consciousness? I think... There is this phenomenon that happens in meditation where you feel when you're in the absolute present, a sort of feeling of living outside the subjective, but I think it's through your perception, so it's still subjective, and I think it's a game we play with ourselves to have a relationship with it. And I do think if humans spent more time doing these things, they would probably spend less time doing more harm uh, engaging activity but at the same time that harm engaging activity is a part of their story girl it flew out i know mariah girl it flew out okay i have to censor myself on the internet because y'all are so emotional not you guys but other people which i understand because they don't have free will oh the way it flew out oh the way it flew out it was like poetry on the tongue you know made it says so how do we even comprehend the objective well that's the thing i don't think we do you know what i mean K says, if everything's determined, that would mean something had the free will to choose how the determined order of things would proceed. No, total disagree. I believe we're evolved animals on a planet, evolved over time. I do think on the macro, it's all determined. It's already happened. I live like I've already lived my life. I, as far as I am concerned, I'm dead. I've already, I've already lived my life. I've already been 90. As far as I'm concerned, like time is illusion. You know what I mean? Like I've already lived. I'm a biological little creature doing my little creature things on earth. But I think it is, there is an overall determined, because once you zoom out into the universe, you don't even exist in a tangible sense, which means like the idea of you making a choice doesn't exist, which means the idea of you even like making a choice, like nothing, you know what I mean? I don't think you need something to exist. I think when we say determined, we're saying in the same way that a bear could have just been a bear or my cat was a cat or like it was, it's already going to be what it is. How about that? In a philosophy sense, you could say, it is what it is, and it's always going to be what it is. Whatever ends up being the thing that happens was always what was going to happen. You could argue that that's what they mean by determined, which means there's still some sort of practical 
free will being evoked. But I, again, when I'm talking about introspection, I'm saying like in that moment, I was speaking fastly and using words that were really comfortable to me. It's true. I use the R slur in my real life. Oh my God, everybody have a stroke. But the thing is, is like when I'm on the internet, I try to evoke more of my consciousness and I try to be more self-aware, which I obviously fail in sometimes. And I try to say, not, don't say that word. Because if you say that word, people on the internet, because they're in different cultural bubbles, will get upset for no reason. Except the reason is a reason. It's their culture. And you're going to like ostracize people that aren't going to be able to. So blah, 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 blah. I have trouble seeing, but I worked so hard to get there. Being able to work so hard is another biological attribute, just like having like good dexterity with your fingers. So Actually, I think my journey into neurodivergency or my journey into chronic health is a part of that biological argument. Like I love working seven days a week, but I can't hustle the way other people can hustle. Not everyone can be Asmongold. To be Asmongold, you would have to be Asmongold. You cannot just be him. He is a biological phenomenon and he's a specific kind of biological creature that has evolved over time, right? So- so he is within himself like an anomaly. I couldn't be him even if I tried. I can't be David Goggins if I tried. Because I'm that's I'm not that I have evolved to be that person. <clears throat> so I think in a lot of ways your success is predicated on what you were able to do. I know for a fact I hustle the way I do and I make the money that I do and I do what I do because I was born into this body with these attributes and even though I've been mentally ill, even though I have illnesses that other people would be like I would never want that. I also, for my category of person, have done pretty well for myself, right? Thank you for the new meme. Let's go, Discord. It is what it is. Based. I'm so smart, bro. I am fucking, <laughs> I'm a genius, bro. I'm a genius. Kay says, so do you think this is, this is the only way reality could play out and that it's just over? In which case, do you think there are multiple realities with different configurations running simultaneously or is this one order of reality the only option forever objectively yes in some sense obviously in some sense like what is 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 you do efforts you make efforts i believe in your ability to change course but whatever course you end up changing it to it was always going to be that answer so i think you have a choice to change your future in the same way it was always going to be what it was i feel like we're living in a show that's already ended but we're still in the beginning seasons. Like I feel like life is a show. You don't know where it's going, but like the like somebody already does. And that's why I think humans created the image of God to say God already knows the end of our story. He knew us before we came into the womb. He knew us outside of the womb. He knows us in the grave. I think humans created the illusion of God to explain a phenomenon of understanding that like my story has already happened and I'm just living it out. But the story for me has changed but the story outside of me, the macro versus the micro, it's already, I, there's no change. You know, when you watch How I Met Your Mother and the the mom, they, he finally meets the mom and then she dies and he ends up with Robin anyways. It's like, what the fuck was that? No matter how much we wanted the ending to change, he was always going to end up with Robin. Gross. He should have ended up with the mom, right? I think that's how life is. But at the same time, on the micro, we have this relationship with free will. But on the macro, like it's already happened. Whatever it's going to happen has already happened. Nonpal says we just don't know. We don't have any empirical evidence for alternative realities. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I believe in like realities and that. Like, like mm -mm. I'm busy trying to figure out this one. Thank you. Spoiler, <laughs> Hannah, stop. So you believe in destiny? Um, I believe what is is. What will be, what will be. That's what I believe. What will be, will be. And it is what it is. Call that destiny if you want. I've never really identified it with the word destiny, but you can call it that if you'd like. I think when people hold on to destiny, like this is my destiny, I don't believe in that. When, when Zuko goes, I know my destiny, uncle. I don't believe that. I think you can change the outcome, but whatever the outcome is, was always going to be. But it's not about this is my destiny. I have to fulfill my death. You're not fulfilling anything. You're not fulfilling anything. There is nothing that is already. It's not destiny in that sense. It's just it is what it's going to be. And that's it. So they can like suture you without like making a mistake kind of thing. Um, I think it's in the realm of we need to make sure it's only competent people who are doing brain surgery on you. 
And we need to have them motivated enough so that they've gone enough sleepless nights to learn how to master this and to do all that, yet somehow have the person, rather than thinking, I've earned extra consideration, I earned to be able to be in the front of the line. Because okay, wait, Kay says, I agree on uh, that it can only be what it is. I was mainly wondering what the question after, if you think there are multiple configurations or configs running, or if this is the only one, just a meta question. Um, when you say multiple ones running, like I think there's only one reality and we are organisms living in that reality. But every reality that exists is a reality. So like I don't know anything outside of this perception. I have no reason to think there are alternative universes. I have no reason to think that I'm something special within the universe. I have no evidence or reason to believe that I'm just not living a life the same way that a dog is living his life or a bear is living their life. Like I just am. And then here I am doing my thing. Um, is that what you mean? Or do you mean like the one life I have will be something different? I think I'm a little confused on the exact question. Are you asking me about other universes or are you asking me about the your life going in different directions? Your life is going to go in as many directions as you choose for it to go into. And then the direction it goes into was always going to be where it went. And then depending on the introspection level you have, that's going to determine how many choices you even have at your disposal. If you're born into a Catholic bubble and you never pop that bubble, then the only options you were ever going to have in your life was to be Catholic. But if you're in a Catholic bubble and you pop that bubble and choose a different path, well, obviously you're going to end up somewhere else. Does that make sense? Because of how skillful I am, and here's where I'm getting utopian ridiculously, for them to mostly just feel great. The differences between destiny and determinism, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, is that destiny is sort of a play on like, this is my destiny. It's like a fulfillment, like scripture. It has a sort of a, a spiritual connotation. But determinism is sort of a biological or radical reality in relation to quantum physics that says this is the science that says it's determined versus the destiny is evoked through like a spiritual lens. Is that correct? Or no, is that fucking wrong? Gratitude and pleasure at seeing what their hands are able to do. Wow, I lucked out. Wow, sit me down at a keyboard of a piano and look how it turned out that I'm the sort of person with a sort of nervous system where I can now play something that moves people to tears. Wow, how cool is that, that I lucked out and got to be like someone who could experience that. Experience knowing that you were able to generate this. Okay, so that's totally Val, Val says, if things are determined for the end of your life story, what motivates you to evoke your free will and just not react to your environment? Um, this is where Robert would come in and say my biology. I just don't think I could have been anyone else. I think I would have unalived myself if I didn't make a different, if I didn't have a different relationship with my reality. That's why I say people wonder if they could go back to being twos, what I call twos and fives on my level system of introspection. Um, so I think that things are always like determined in a biological sense, but I think the way that I have my story is like, I don't think I chose my personality. I don't, I don't think I chose this body that I'm in. I don't think I choose the family I'm born. I don't think I choose anything except the relationship I'm having with my consciousness, which is also only sort of a choice because I've decided to utilize tools that I listened to, learned, or read about. So which you could argue is the tools that I was given as a biological entity, right? I can't just react to my environment. It isn't within who I am as a as a person. I just can't. Like, I can't seem to do it. Um, I tried. I tried many times. I was always down the path of unaliving myself. I always tried to unalive myself when I felt trapped by that. So the moment I decided to do something different, I found it led me to my joy, which is why I don't think everyone needs to know they're like, oh, things are determined or... Uh, you're too living in a bubble and there's like other options. Like, I just don't think we need to do that. Mabby says we are always reacting to our environment though. I'm not, I don't believe that. Is your environment what's outside of yourself? Then I certainly don't believe that, right? I don't have that lived experience. I have a lived experience that I would use with the limited language I have to say I'm not always reacting to my environment, nor am I always reacting to the things that are within my body or the way my brain is misfiring. So, you know what I mean? Reacting, that that means something. You know what I mean? What is it to react? When people say like, you're not reacting to me. So again, how are you using language? Obviously, you know what it is when a person doesn't react to you or doesn't seem to react to their environment. 
It also can indicate a psychological mishap in your brain. So when we say like people aren't reacting, it means something. And then the question is, it means something in a philosophy sense and it means something in a biological sense or in a perceived sense ridiculous that we're going to think of making people go through like years and years of neurosurgery residencies and like all of the agonies of that and the enormous emotional investment and everything else in there that they will come out the other end and say yes all i do is feel gratitude that the randomness of the universe has put me in a position where i can help people by removing their glioblastomas you know that one's going to be an uphill battle obviously and there's that bias that the people listening to this will probably be tilted already in a direction where there's something they've worked hard at and they're good at and all of that and asking that we just have like gratitude for how randomness turned out with us that we were given the gifts to make less pain in the world around all these other machines yeah you got to get a pretty highfalutin state of mind where that's going to yeah that's where meditation comes in right in some ways if you translate this into a philosophy meditative perspective this is having like practicing gratitude and realizing like, yeah, I'm better off than some people. And then I can make a decision to use that to help people or not. Obviously, I use it in some ways to help people, but in most ways, it's obviously to help myself because I think everything is selfish and inherently selfish and self-focused, right? Like it's just survival 101. But at the same time, like I think I'm a good community member. I think I try to help people, right? Have these conversations, whatever that means. But Robert is Robert is right. Regardless of what you are conveying to a whole population of people, telling them that they could have more of a say in their life is difficult because they feel like they already have all the say or none of the say, which is sort of ironic with his determinist perspective. You can't translate this language to a group of humans who in the practical sense – obviously feel like they're making a choice and we certainly punish people like they're making a choice and then we certainly judge people as if they're making a choice and then we look at Robert and we give him credit for making the choice to be educated and then we trust him more because he's decided to be educated and so because he's educated we make the decision to you know what I mean it's all of these things work um maybe all we could do with that sort of a lower end version of the solution is just recognize how inappropriate a sense of entitlement is in all sorts of domains because you can do something fancy in a scalpel with a scalpel doesn't mean you are a better person than somewhere else and yeah i think it like i'm fascinated who is robert talking about is he just like is this academia bubble like who is he talking about you know what i mean like i think that's only somewhat true in people's schemas like to think like oh because i'm a doctor i'm better than you like yeah we call that the snobby rich people bubble bro or like the snobby like you think you're better than me because like your genetics or whatever like most religions teach you not to think that way and most political structures have some group play but not much different than other people's like i'm not sure like who is he taught when he says entitlement i hate entitlement i agree but who is he talking about? I want to know who he is talking about. And that seems like a plausible thing to try to train society in. Um, it's not too lunatic to get people to the point where a really, really skilled neurosurgeon <clears throat> and a really, really skilled garbage collector can both feel good about themselves and feel good that they lucked out to have this ability, but not that they're somehow better than the person next to them who can't do that. This is a very complicated idea. So um, as somebody who really focuses, I was going to say takes pride, but I know better. Uh, <laughs> as somebody who focuses a lot on usefulness, I, I want things to be useful. I want to put useful ideas out. I want to take useful ideas in. So I know a, a part of what we're going to want to touch on today is very much what the societal implications are for this and how we can improve society. Criminal justice system, I know, is an example you use a lot. That'll be a good one to talk about. Um, before we get to that, though, what I have a mantra in business, which is don't try to change behavior, try to leverage it. And I feel, and you obviously acknowledge it. You say, look, uh, it's going to be a tall order to get people to do it. I'm stepping into utopian zone. But um, when I hear these ideas, I start thinking, okay, well, how do we make sure that these become useful? How do we get them to generate momentum so that life really can be better? Now, you didn't expressly push, push back on my North Star. So I'll assume for now that we're both on board with... Um, we want people to thrive and we want to reduce suffering as much as possible. Um, I th Why? Why? I know that I believe that getting people to um, the point where 
we give them as good of a shot as humanly possible to um, biologically be ready to absorb useful ideas and to encounter those ideas as much as possible. So I obsess a lot about education and what that looks like. In fact, before we started rolling, I was talking to you about, I'm so grateful to you. You've put so much content out into the world that just makes it more likely that people are going to encounter those ideas. Okay. So anyway, going back to the idea of don't try to fight behavior, try to leverage it. Don't try to fight biology, try to leverage it. So we've got like evolution has selected four things. And one of those things is that, and I think you have said this in the past, we are a hungry species. We hunger for so many things. And I think about when somebody comes to me and is like, you know, Hey, I'm really struggling in my life. The first thing I say is go serve somebody else. Get out of your own head, go do something awesome for somebody else. We are evolutionarily wired for that because we're a social creature. And so you want to do things that elevate not only you, but other people. So I just, I'm not fighting the biology. I know you will get something positive out of that. And then the other one though, is progress, make progress in your own life, set a goal and work towards that. I, I make video games. I assume you know nothing about my background, but we make video games here. And so all day long, we're thinking about reaching into somebody's brain and squeezing the dopamine centers to, um, get them to want to engage. Now for now, just assume that I'm not an evil schmuck that's just trying to get all the money in the world. And that my whole reason for existing is implanting empowering ideas and entertainment. Why, 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 why? Why, why, why not just create video games to get that dopamine rushing? Why is he, why is he like defending himself? Uh, but nonetheless, we have to think about that. And so when I want to get to the point where these ideas are not encountering sort of utopian, like whatever is like, this is never going to happen. I want to say what, what's real, like meritocracy is not going away because people value things and they, what we may change what they value fair enough, but they're going to value a thing and they're going to want to get good at that thing. And they're going to want to be praised for doing that thing. And they're going to want to feel that they're better for doing that thing. And it's like, we've already run the experiment. Monks are people that are like, Hey, I'm not an idiot. I recognize I need to be grateful. I need to see a blossoming flower for what it is and really see it and understand a rock and know that there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so just nobody does it. So it's like this tiny, tiny fraction. So do you think that I'm misunderstanding what we, what will be easy to get us to do? And what will be hard to get us to do? I agree completely. It's very, very hard, it seems, to get around the problem of motivation and drive and even dirty words like ambition and things of that sort in a context of there being no free will. Um, amid that, though, we can show over and over that we can manage that in some domains because we have already managed it. Okay, so a bit of social conditioning you meet someone and you shake their hand and they say, oh, you have beautiful eyes. And we're all conditioned to say, thanks. And most of us who are sensible say thanks. And then a quarter second later, realize how idiotic that is. Wow. Thanks for praising me for my choice of photoreceptor genes. Um, you know, that's a domain where we've made some progress with that. Most people would feel sheepish if the other person went on for too long. Most people would be willing to point out the realities of agency or lack thereof if someone tried to introduce a law that people with your eye color get treated better in society. Um, most people would see the fallacy of that. So we've accomplished that in that domain. Um, we're able to navigate a world in which people can appreciate eye color and where in general, the person complimented for it does not come out of that feeling entitled that they earned their eye color. And I don't know enough about the history of people liking eye colors and such, but I'm sure there was a time in the past where, you know, with a mindset where basically every attribute that anyone had that was positive was a sign that they had a good soul because beauty on the outside and beauty inside were exactly the same and intertwined and, and disease is God's way of punishing you. And that also, there was a time in the past where someone said, you have beautiful eyes, would know that they were being complimented about their moral, moral anchor, because the two go hand in hand. And then we kind of learned, no, nah, that actually has nothing to do with it. It's just like, so you can say, oh, thanks, because you're socialized and you say that. And like, if you come out of it feeling like you have earned that compliment for your eye color, that's ridiculous. Yet at times in the past, there's people who would have interpreted it exactly that way. We're in a mindset now that your eye color is not some sort of index of your worth as a person. We managed to get there. Well, and we can manage to. Well, you know, we're, there are still people who are arguing that skin color and eye color definitely make you better or worse than other people. I mean, I think racism still exists, my friend. Um, colorism still exists in humans. 
because uh, we're tribal little creatures. So even racism and all of that, I do think that's a part of nature. I think humans form racist patterns to have like better tribal understanding of like who can be safe and feel safe. We see it mimicked um, all over the world. We see it in social groups. We see it in like understanding and like what feels normal or, you know, understandable to us. Uh, I think everything humans do is within nature and everything we do is within our evolution as biological creatures on a planet. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in any of those things. If God is real, it would be a part of the organism of the earth as well. Like if a God existed, it would also be an evolved organism on the planet in a biological sense. But the way we think of God is sort of like beyond humans, but I don't think so. Um, how you look doesn't make you a better person. Well, Obviously, how you look doesn't make you a better person, but it is true that how you keep yourself could, well, what is a better person is subjective to the consciousness. It's not a real thing. So there is no like good and bad. There's just is. And so good and bad is like from the perspective of the person. So even having the defense of like saying like looking better doesn't make you a good person. That's only through the perception of the subjective anyways. It could be true if you had that conversation in a different way. People who tend to be hygienic might take better care of their kids. Maybe, but not necessarily, right? So again, when we're having this conversation, it's like, what do you mean by better? You know, how you look doesn't make you a better person. It might, depending on the context, right? But how you keep yourself is really what we're saying. It's not how you look. It's how you keep yourself or dress your avatar or dress whatever, however you want to say it. So again, like I, I think there's so many layers to this conversation already. I'm just trying to listen. I'm trying not to pause it every two seconds. We're only 30 minutes in. But I I, I have a problem following who his oppo opposition is. So this opposition he's fighting right now that says like, oh, we're better because like we're more educated or more this or more this. Like I don't know what opposition he's fighting. I think I'm just in the normie bubble. So I'm assuming it's something from his academia background. I'm just trying to figure out, like, who is his opposition? You know what I mean? V says, you didn't earn your eye color. So when people compliment my eyes, they say, thanks, I grew them myself. And how do we define what is better or worse? Well, you're being kind of an asshole, right? Like, Robert's an asshole. By saying the eye color thing is a good example, it's a social signal. We're socialing that you understand an expectation of behavior which signals safety to the clan. So when you say, like, oh, thank you so much, you're saying, I know because I'm not a fucking idiot, that what they're trying to do is pay me a compliment and they're trying to say something about you I like, which opens the opportunity for you two to signal to one another safety, which then allows you guys to have a further conversation into something less superficial. That's what complimenting your eye color is, you fucking retards. Oh my God, I'm doing it again. I can't evoke my free will right now. My biology is telling me to get pissed. Guys, if somebody says, I like your eye color, they're asking you, do you recognize that I'm paying you a compliment? And then you go, yes, thank you so much for opening an opportunity. Why is it so aggressive in here? Girl, we haven't even started. I'm being nice. I'm being nice. This is not me and my fault. There's no free will. This isn't my fault. This is my biology. Okay. Like a, a compliment is meant to open an opportunity for connection, whether it's insidious or not. Right? Like whether it's insidious or not. So you could have somebody who says, I really like you in that swimsuit, which could be like insidious. Like, or you'd be like, girl, I really like you in that swimsuit, which is more like a safety communication. Like, okay, we're seeing each other. But maybe if somebody goes up to like your child and goes, I really like when you're in that swimsuit. That's like, what? Like, don't say that to my child. It's because we're signaling different things with different words. So when somebody tries to be like a smart aleck and go, oh, you like my eyes? I grew them myself. Or, oh, you like my eyes? Like, cool for liking my receptor neurons. Blah, 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 whatever Robert said. You're just being like an asshole. You're being like an, what are you, a Redditor? Like, what is that, a Redditor? Girl slipping out like a toot. Stop, Mariah, stop. I know, I'm being a mess. You know what it is? Because people like this make me want to be more, ironically, a little bit more like my un- censored self because I'm like okay let's have that conversation then but like you know what I mean like why are you being cheeky like why do these people in high education positions 
act like they know better than everyone else, and then end up mimicking all of society anyways. The example he just gave is mimicking all of society anyways. You know what I mean? I'm just annoyed. I think I annoyed that people in positions of like, I know better and the world doesn't is just, we don't. We're all just the same on the planet. But I get it because that's what I sound like too when people, when people hear my work. I get it. I think he's just saying the same thing. We're all just humans on a planet doing our best, bros. If somebody says you have a nice eye color, say thank you and move the fuck on. Signal that you know you're not dumb. Cosmic says he's not fighting an opposition. He's making a statement that free will doesn't exist. Then discussing the implications of that fact and will and people reject it. But he's not. He's named, he's not making the full argument. Look, I'll get through his book. I have it on audio book, but he's not making the argument. He It's almost like we came into a conversation that like we didn't hear the beginning of a little bit. So that's fine. That's probably what is actually happening a little bit. To get there in other domains as well. Like there are people, somebody with photographic memory may think it's kind of cool or find circumstances where it's advantageous. I mean, there are being circumstances where photographic memory is not advantageous, but we are of a sufficiently informed mechanistic world at this point that they don't think they had anything to do with their photographic memory or the fact that they happen to have perfect pitch or something like that. And if people praise them too much for that, they're able to feel a little sheepish. I, had, I don't know. I just read a page and I remember it. What I just glance at it and I remember it. I had nothing to do with it. I can just hear a C sharp in my head anytime I want. And it's always like perfect down to like a couple of beats of, you know, vibration. That's how I turned out. We've been able to get to the point where some of those ways in which we can be appreciated for some positive attribute, we can accept the appreciation. He must be talking about incredibly like uncivilized societies, which doesn't even make sense to me because who's that? Like, again, most of humanity does realize, I think, maybe I'm wrong here, that some people are, that's why we say you're born talented. Like, we know you didn't work hard to get there, which means you would be sheepish because you know you didn't even have to work for it. It just happened. Or sometimes you do have to work for it and you're like a David Goggins who's like, every day of my life is like a struggle. Every day of my life, I'm like everybody else and I get up and I do it. Everybody else is average but me. But I am average and I am like everybody else. It's like, yeah, we're all like each other, bro. Because there's no, like, no need for a hierarchy. But since we're all biologically different, obviously what David Goggins can do, other people can't do because they weren't biologically built like him. So maybe it's that language issue I'm having. Mm -hmm. While accepting, actually, we had nothing to do with it. And I'm not sure I would be comfortable in a world in which only people with perfect pitch get to have COVID vaccines. We've done that in some realms. We could do it more, but it's not going to be easy. Okay. So uh, let me ask, do you believe people should build their self-esteem? Yes. And just because I am of the place and time that in some realms, we could do it more, but it's not going to be easy. Okay. So uh, let me ask, do you believe people should build their self-esteem? Do you believe people should build their self-esteem? Yes. And just because I am of the place and time to, if nothing else, see that as instrumentally a good thing. People will work harder if they have good self-esteem. People will be able to put their shortcomings into proper perspective and realize that something bad may be bad, but it's not the entire world and it is not your destiny. Things like that are protective and efficacious, and that's often a good tool to have to make somebody feel better self-esteem. Like a great example where that intersects with all of this, um, a domain where we used to see room for blame and labeling and insights into lack of motivation, all of that is, you know, when I was a kid, if, you know, I had trouble learning to read and I simply was not getting there and it would be very easy at the time for me to be labeled as lazy or unmotivated or whatever. And then along comes scientist about 30 years ago and discovers that, no, you can have some screwy thing happening with a layering of neurons and like layer four of this part of your cortex. And as a result, like, curved loop letters, you tend to reverse them when you're looking at them. Dyslexic. And you have dyslexia. And that's great. We just figured that out. That's great on a very concrete level um, because people could then learn what to, do, what to do for people with dyslexia so they could learn to read more readily. It gives you sort of more insight into the outliers. But what it also does, bring it back. One thing that makes me doubt that I'm actually dyslexic 
is that I've been reading from a really young age. Uh, so it makes me wonder, even though that does happen to me, and I do read words wrong, like we play Wordle, or not Wordle, we play Connections all the time, and I always read the words wrong the first time I read them over, then I read them again, and I'm like, oh shit, okay, I thought that was a different word this whole time. But I've been reading at such a young age, I wonder, I mean, my mom taught me how to read, right? Because I was homeschooled. Uh, I do wonder if she had a hard time teaching me how to read. I don't remember any of those stories growing up. And I've been reading ever since, so I'm not sure. Hmm. Back to this is like in the old bad world where you're screwed up cortical layering in this part of your brain instead is interpreted as laziness and lack of motivation is your self-perception and your self-esteem is built around that for the rest of your life. And one sees all the ways in that becomes self-defeating and like these endless, wow, it wasn't until I was 40 that I was diagnosed with this learning difference and all those years that I felt myself being this, yeah. Self-esteem is a good thing to build up for efficacy thereafter. Self-esteem is not a good thing if it fuels entitlement, but it certainly has its place. And we can see those circumstances where we decide we're watching agency where there wasn't and the outcome isn't great and the kid still isn't learning how to read and they are being taught what their self-esteem is going to mumble you know, in their ears for the rest of their lives now. That's a pretty bad thing. What should people build their self-esteem? Yeah, I really think entitlement's like the opposite of wisdom not that i'll die wise I'll probably die unwise um but yeah i think that's interesting like his focus on entitlement i think is kind of what stands out to me the most and i think that's a really reasonable perspective just because i think entitlement is really just like it's not a good trait in human beings it doesn't seem to be helpful and garnering like the healthiest and most harm reduction society and he says there is such a thing as milder dyslexia. I might have that. Steam around. Well, given that none of it makes sense and we're all machines and it makes no sense for a machine to feel good about itself and that's irrational, except when it makes the machine work. Yeah. So I don't literally think we're machines. I think we're creatures. I think we're animals and animals have feelings and animals have motivators. Animals have desires. So I don't think of us as machines. I think of us as animals. Animals have feelings. Animals have like, you know what I mean? So we should want to have a reasoning behind that. That's interesting. So I guess like, yeah, I guess the reason I wouldn't, yeah, I couldn't think of myself as a literal machine. I think of myself as a creature. And creatures have plenty of feelings and motivators and, um, contemplations and reactions and all these things so yeah i don't logic my way to my feelings like i'm experiencing life i'm life experiencing itself right so the idea well that sounds really woo woo but you know what i mean um yeah cosmic says and all those feelings and desires are arbitrary so so what does arbitrary mean to you without meaning so like what does arbitrary mean to you um charles says how do you determine when you're wise who knows who knows you know who knows better except when one has learned the contingencies well enough that the right kind of self-esteem will make someone kinder will make them more likely to feel somebody else's pain will foster all sorts of good stuff yeah in those cases, if your self-esteem is built around, you know, the world is going to have been a better place because a whole bunch of molecules came together randomly and formed that thing. Does Robert believe in assisted suicide? Cosmic says you experience all that and there's no free will. That's his point. Yeah, I just don't know why he feels like he has the evidence for that. Unless he's just saying free will in his bubble is a very different definition than in other bubbles. If he's using the religious version of free will, meaning every single person, every single entity, every single human being, X, Y, Z, then maybe, you know what I mean? I just don't know what point he's making. Like, who is his argument against? Because he's not making a neutral argument, right? He keeps saying these people that are entitled, these people that think this way, who? That I call me. That's a good reason to have self-esteem. 
Now going back to, cause here is the confounding variable. You were talking about people understand that their eyes are just their genetics and they didn't do anything to deserve it, which obviously I totally agree. Um, but at the same time, beauty has power. Uh, I didn't do anything to deserve being six feet tall, but I can reach things that my wife can't. So how I coming at it from my perspective, I wouldn't want people to build their self-esteem around something that they didn't earn just because I don't think it will return um, anything super useful. But this is where I'd want them to start leaning into the delusion of free will and say, but I would want you to, for instance, just use your example to say, hey, go out of your way to be more kind and doing things like that, that you're now putting attention and energy into uh, that. I would say build your self-esteem around that. Now, again, this goes back to North Star for me. Everything is adding up to you want to do things that increase human flourishing, your own and others, decrease human suffering, your own and others. Um, but I would encourage them to do that. Do you at that point? have such a, a reaction to the illusion of free will and the negative consequences that you see to that, which I, the word you've used the most, like if we were to do a word uh, diagram, entitlement would just be this gigantic glowing red orb. Um, are you so concerned that the illusion of free will creates a sense of entitlement and probably self-defeating, right? Because it's going to create entitlement in people who think they're awesome. And the, the delusion of determinism, create. what do you mean? Determinism and free will can create entitlement easily. Determinism would make the entitled feel more entitled. Like that's what I'm saying. Entitlement is a relationship you're having with your consciousness and understanding of self. So whether it's free will or it's determinism, an entitled person would still feel entitled. What? And it's going to create a sense of self-defeating, I'm lame, I'm not worthy, and people who fall out of step for whatever reason, which could go back to natal, prenatal, epigenetic, I mean, before they're even born. Um, are you so afraid of that, that you would never want somebody to lean into the like, hey, like, I know free will doesn't exist, but I operate my daily life like it does. Maybe the conclusion is, you know, some nice pragmatic, pragmatic thing, which is like, it's it's impossible to imagine how we're supposed to function if we really, really reject the notion of free will all the time. I've thought this way since I was 14, and I can't imagine it or pull it off 99% of the time because um, it's really, really hard. Maybe what we should do in the face of reality of how hard this is, because we are people of our place and time and things that intuitively seem just intertwined with our sense of efficacy and our goodness and our well you know, intentions and all of that maybe save the effort for when it really counts maybe save it for when you know judgment is really consequential hmm. when people really are causing damage if they secretly believe they're a better person than somebody else for something they had nothing to do with when people are okay with a society running on myths of like any kid could grow up to be president kind of thing yeah put your effort into the rare ones of those and like if you want to feel good about yourself because your eye color you know go ahead it's not the end of the world um you know save it for where it matters i think i'm i'm not even a psychology major but i think i'm too into social studies and psychology to not understand like the eye color example still doesn't make sense because it's a social structure. Everything is a social thing. It exists because it's signaling an understanding within social interactions. People don't literally feel good because their eye color is blue. They feel good it's blue because people have told them to feel good about it, which would agree. Uh, would, which would match his understanding of environment. So people don't literally feel good because their eyes are blue outside of... People who feel entitled are the same victims of people who grow up in poverty and never get out. This is what I understand about Robert's work. My work is better. I'm going to say it right now. I'm a better thinker. Bro, I'm a, I'm a better fucking thinker. Listen to me. You can't... This is a horrible argument. I refuse to believe this is his argument. I refuse to believe this. He made an argument earlier that saying that people in poverty are this way and we shouldn't judge people because like they're always biological, then why are you judging the entitled? The entitled are also part of a bubble structure that has convinced them to be entitled, which is why you need introspection to get yourself out of poverty and to be less entitled. This can't be his argument. Am I tired today? I could be tired. I'm a human. I'm flawed. I'm dumb. But this cannot be his argument. What? And he says, do you associate wisdom with age? Absolutely not. But I think it correlates more than not. What is happening? 
what is happening? If entitled people are, oh, I'm so, what's happening? It's not just social because the social interacts with our biology. Yes, I agree with that. I agree with that. And now you're saying, nah, you're actually so ignorant, Brittany, sorry. Then what is he explaining? Right? And again, it's through our perception. Robert's work is not rooted in objective. You're just, you literally just said his scientific um, research is on the probability. It's not even objective. It's still a probability. How is he any more objective than my perspective? When it's all done through the perspective of our biology. He is not closer to the answer. If his only argument is like people shouldn't be entitled, but also we should understand why people stay poor. Where is his understanding that people are entitled? How does he not understand the blue eyes thing? Or like you, I like the color of your eyes thing. He's not explaining that argument. He's using it as a duh argument, but he's not explaining the opposite side of it. Tracy says entitlement is often a product of psychological problem with lacking affection in childhood, for example. So whoever he's talking to might just need to go to therapy, literally. But also, if we know people stay in poverty because of biology, you think people don't enti like feel entitlement because of their biology or the tools that they're given? So again, like I might be ignorant, maybe I'm an idiot, but the man just gave examples that are easily discounted by an idiot on the internet. So... Charles says you should feel good because people like your eye color, but you know you don't deserve anything because of it. Yeah, but you're taught to deserve things. You're taught by people who have formed tribes over an evolved amount of time, millions of years, to come together to build this thing we call humanity. And then even animals have, the, we're animals, we all have this within ourselves, to ostracize and pull people in depending on what they look like. What? What? He's just mad because he has poop colored eyes. Hey, 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 you be nice to him. <laughs> Kay says he wants to influence people to use their free will to acknowledge that there is no free will. Oof. Cosmic says society is an abstract Im Im image. Uh, I can't say that word. Imagent, imagent phenomenon. Biology is physical matter. That's the difference. Yeah, I think Robert's just wrong. I think he's just wrong. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't map on to like the lived experiences or the other studies other people are doing. You could say on the macro, we're all biology. And he says, you're right. There's a lot of research for the major heretical component behind personality traits as well. Like literally, which is, you could argue, biology or genetics. But again, like I don't understand his ability to be compassionate to those in poverty, but not compassionate to those who are entitled. I would argue that I would challenge you to be more thoughtful to those who are entitled. I don't think you should be entitled. But I know you got there for a reason. Why did you get there into entitlement? Who trained you to be so entitled? Why did you make the decision to continue being entitled? Why haven't you changed course? I don't think once entitled, always entitled. Neither does Robert. Robert just said, don't be entitled, which indicates you can stop being entitled. But can you stop being in poverty? Because the same people that grew up entitled are the same people who grew up in poverty. They just look differently, differently and they come in different things, but they're probably socialized the same or socialized differently by their parents or given love in certain capacities or born with birth defects or have issues with their brains or maybe they're neurodivergent. So again, until I hear him be compassionate with the entitled, I think his bias is showing, which is fine because we're all biased. You know? Okay. And I think what is amply clear is in a world in which the organizing myth is- we Also, I'm being very sarcastic when I say I'm a better thinker, but obviously I'm a genius, so- What we deserve and effort somehow is coupled with outcome, um, there'll be no shortage of finding places where it really matters. Let me ask you, when you think about the, the grips of the biology, the biases that we have, the things that we are in the grips of, what are the ones that make you most concerned? Obviously we have entitlement, which I think if I'm understanding you correctly, entitlement is born of thinking that you have earned height, beauty, intelligence, whatever, whatever. Um, what are other traps that we fall into that for tomorrow to be better than today, we need to get people out of? Hmm. One of the biggest. So what activism can I engage in? Aria, welcome to my channel. I'm sure you're new. Calling one of your chatters an asshole and retarded just because they disagree is incredibly immature. That's not what happened. And also that doesn't mean anything. The language is loving. Everyone's a little retarded. Everyone's a little immature. Everyone's a little bit of an asshole, right? If you think 
that's you don't like the language. You're just sensitive in a way that I'm not sensitive about. Or you have an objective to the language uh, or you have a belief system that surrounds us and calls it. You're moralizing it. Cool. I don't think I meant anything by it. Right. The arrogance is off putting. You know, studies have been shown that people don't like arrogance in women. They prefer them to be smiling and docile, but they like arrogance in men, but not as much. But they don't like arrogance in women. You know, studies have shown that. What do you think that is? Do you think that's internalized misogyny? Do you think when men are arrogant, people think they're smart, but when women are arrogant, they don't like it because they expect women to be soft? Huh. Funny. ...ones is one of those uphill battles in terms of like how we're wired up in some very fundamental way, which is in the right setting, a setting of a feeling of righteousness. All What's the effect though? Great, great point. Era says, I just think it's not effective. What's the effect you think I'm aiming for? Clearly by the way they reacted, well, what was the effect you thought I wanted? You're assuming my effect. You're assuming what I'm here to do. I'm here to do nothing more than share tools. What do you think I'm doing here? What do you think? I think that person leaving chat made a lot of sense. They need to go to a bubble that makes sense to them. This is a bubble. We all live in bubbles. So everyone's picking a space they feel most comfortable in to reassure and reinforce their biases, prejudices, and what's comfortable to them. I do it. You do it. We all do it, right? So what do you think the reason for me being here is? Are you having a parasocial relationship with me right now and assuming my intent? You're assuming I'm assuming. Well, you made a statement that makes no sense. You said, I just think it's not effective. Clearly by the way they reacted. Words mean nothing. That's true. They are a construct. I agree. Uh, have I seen anime monster? No. Why does everyone tell me to do that? The anime monster? No. What is that? People keep saying that. Discord said, oh, yes, using a justification to be judgmental while also shaming being judgmental. It's humans. Humans are going to human. I hope you stay. Everly? Aria? Everly. Everly. I hope you stay. I hope you enjoy the bubble. I get it, though. We all have different ways. Look, I don't love the way Robert's speaking right now. You don't love the way I'm speaking. And yet, we're going to give Robert a chance. Love him. He's so sweet. I love him. And I like Tom, too. I don't love the way they're talking. But, you know, here we are learning. So that we like to punish we like to punish individuals and translating that into like actual biology, like one of the most reliable ways of getting dopamine running and anticipation and all of that is to have somebody think that they are going to be able to punish someone for an infraction and that they are doing something righteous. And you see the same thing with rats. You get a rat that is being stressed and is secreting stress hormones and it gets to bite another rat, a complete innocent bystander, and the first rat's stress hormone levels go down. It feels better. And you see the same thing in non-human primates, you know, displacing aggression, displacing frustration, and then especially inventing cultural trappings that tell you this is actually like good civic duty. That one's really tough. Because if you're trying to say, it makes no sense whatsoever to have a world in which there's any blame or punishment, Damn, but it kind of does feel good to punish. Like, I know of this guy who's coming up for, what, four, five different criminal trials in the next year. And I will be very pleased if the outcome is if he's locked up for years to come and maybe even like... Is he talking about Trump? Why are you going to lock up Trump? He had no free will. Obviously, Trump is obviously just reacting to reacting. You want to talk about somebody who's just reacting to his life? Trump. Is he talking about Trump right now? feels lonely in the process but yeah that really doesn't make sense um i mean i see this all the time and in, in like at a point a few years ago I, I i do a lot of work with public defenders offices with murderers saying humans humaning is not an insult hive's gonna hive is not an insult that's exactly what we believe we believe humans are gonna human they're gonna do exactly what they think is right we're gonna do exactly what we think we should do and we're going to have exactly the relationship we think we should have. It's not bad to be part of a tribe. That's like saying religions are going to religion or whites are going to white and blacks are going to black. Like, yeah, gays are going to gay. Like, we're all going to do what we're going to do, but we're not a monolith all the same. But you only know that if you start evoking some sort of free will relationship. If you get offended at language, you are saying I'm a part of the group of people, thus a hive that believe this language is offensive, which I think is fair. I also find certain language offensive. Usually not really. It's just the context, obviously, because it's not the language that's offensive, right? It's the context. But when you say words are not effective, you're saying I belong to the hive that thinks these words aren't effective. Very real. So when people in my chat are saying humans are going to human, humans are humaning, we're not insulting anyone. We're radically accepting in a philosophy sense. Exactly. 
We're all just doing what makes sense to us and we want to stand up for it and we want to justify it and we want to decide that's a bad person and I'm a good person. You know, Britney's going to Britney based. Very true. Very fucking true. That's the most honest. That's the most honest. I'm just a person, girl. I'm just a person. I'm just living my life. Humans is going to human is low key deterministic. I mean, I'm vibing, bro. It's a vibe, bro. It's true. That's the truest. That's the vibe. What level would you say Robert is? I have no idea, bro. I don't know. I would have to ask him so many more questions. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I would have to ask him so many more questions. And my head in real life on the bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Dun, 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 dun.